This episode of The Curbsiders is sponsored by ACP's Medical Knowledge Self-Assessment Program, MCSAP 18. MKSAP 18 is a comprehensive learning system that meets physician needs for high-quality learning content and individual knowledge assessment. So whether you want to be prepared for your exams or just enjoy lifelong learning, MKSAP 18 is the way to go. Just visit www.acponline.org forward slash MKSAP to get started. For entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash back more hospital and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible to screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know the world. And we're back. Hey, Paul. Hey, Matt, how are you? <laughs> Trying something different tonight. <laughs> Stuart's not here. No one interrupted me. This is the Curbsiders, and that means, Paul, it's time for you to tell people what we do on this show. I, I, I'm completely thrown off by this. It's a whole different energy. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Internal Medicine Podcast, and we use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. And as You are aware we do talk to our guests up front, shame on us, and get to know a little bit more about them, what makes them tick, what they enjoy, what makes them whole people. And if you, too, would like to be a whole person, you will listen to it. Um, Otherwise, feel free to skip ahead looking at our show notes for the timestamps. Paul, I should have told the audience that with us tonight is a wonderful returning co-host, Dr. Carolyn Chan. Carolyn, how are you doing tonight? Good. I'm so glad to be back. Thank you for coming back. You've done some great episodes. You, the Most recently, the C. diff episode, which was a huge hit. And uh, I'm not going to make any puns about that. Can you, can you tell the audience uh, who, who is our guest tonight and, and what are we going to be talking about? Yeah, I'm so excited to bring this episode to you guys tonight because today we have Dr. Foy Whitechu, and the show is just filled with amazing clinical pearls that really help us demystify the wound care process. And through this, we're going to talk about how to clinically assess and treat some really complex wounds. And she gives a great analogy about how wounds are like gardens, which I think may be my new favorite analogy in medicine. It's a great episode. I agree with you. And it also reminds me that we, we talk about gardening and I, I still need to start a garden. Uh, but alas, uh, our guest is Dr. Foy White Chu, MD. She is an assistant professor at Oregon Health and Sciences University, OHSU, and serves as the Geriatrics Medicine Fellowship Director at OHSU. She is also the medical director of the Wound Healing Program at the Portland VA Healthcare System. She graduated from the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center Harvard Geriatrics Fellowship Program in 2009. Her second year of fellowship was dedicated to chronic wound healing and clinician education. She now provides consultative care for complex wounds for veterans at the VA PHCS and serves as the chair of the Prevention of Amputations of Veterans Everywhere Committee. She is also the founder and chair of the Wound Prevention and Management Special Interest Group of the American Geriatric Society and serves on the Education Committee of the Wound Healing Society. Dr. White Chu strives to simplify the complexity of chronic wound care for frontline providers in hopes that all patients can receive timely, appropriate treatments. Paul, I did it. I did. I, strong I, think, work. I think that was one take. <laughs> one <Paul>. take. <laughs> First time. Fantastic. Does anyone have an awful wound pun they like to throw in before we? Uh. Foy, thank you for joining us. And as always, the first question we're going to ask is, can you give the audience a one-liner that describes yourself and, and definitely includes something outside of your job as a physician? Well, uh, that's unfortunate because my, <laughs> my one-liner well, I'll start with the one that first came to mind was I'm an amateur gardener <laughs> okay. uh, and a professional wound healer, and the two worlds tend to collide often. So I'll even go into that more about how they uh, relate. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I'm 43-year-old with two kids and a busy life and doing the PTA and all that other stuff, but enjoying my job. Gardening has come up a bunch on the show. And oh, has it? I've I've publicly now said many times that I want to start a garden. Still haven't started a garden, <laughs> and feel slightly guilty about it. Maybe maybe this year's the year. Twenty nineteen is the year of the garden for me. It was well, literally six degrees last week. I think you have a little bit of time to plan. <laughs> yeah, 
You have to wait a little bit. Here in the Pacific Northwest, anybody can be a gardener. <laughs> Is there something in particular that you really enjoy to grow? Um, I, I, my raspberries went crazy. I have 14 blueberry bushes and, um, I actually have gotten better at growing bok choy. That's been pretty good. Yeah. Those are kind of my, my mains I like to do. Such a different, like it, if you ask people in the Northeast, they're growing like tomatoes and cucumbers. That's like, that's yeah. about it. Yeah. Paul. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm not going to ask for a book recommendation this week. Cause I feel like I have a huge backlog of books that I'm not actually ever going to read. So let me instead ask, um, I'll, I will take any movie recommendation or barring that the last time you actually just went out to see a movie. Oh, I, I mentioned I have two kids, right? It's gotten expensive. <laughs> um, we have a whole host of movies we're ready to go see. Uh, let's see. What's on the oh, docket? Well, oh, yeah, what's on the docket? Let's see. We got uh, How to Train Your Dragon 3, Lego Movie 2. Um, on the plane ride that I just went on with my husband, he and I wrote, watched on separate screens. And we watched... Um, Hidden Figures on the Way Down There. Really enjoyed that. I got the book from the library because I wanted to read more. And then on the way back, we watched Crazy Rich Asians, which we also enjoyed. And so I got those books from the library, too. So although that has like a huge hold list on it. Wow. I admire your ability to watch a movie and then read the book. Because I feel like I always do it the other way around or I or I just can't go back to the book. Fair enough. Oh, that's a trilogy, so I'm getting pretty excited about it. <laughs> Depending on what your kids are into, I saw Spider Verse with my boys. They, oh, amazing. it's really good. Yeah, yes, that was we saw that going to be on my pick of the week. Oh, sorry, Paul. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. <laughs> Maybe you could. Uh, I, I still want to hear you talk about it, Paul. That's always a joy. <laughs> Carolyn, did you, do you want to ask anything? Yeah, I was going to ask. Uh, we like to kind of talk sometimes. So, do you have a particularly favorite failure? Uh, and if, what did you learn from it? Yeah, I really liked this question. Um, so, I mean, there's, I've had plenty of failures as we all have, cause that's how we learn. Um, I'm also a girl scout leader and I'm always teaching the girls about the importance of failing and creating a safe space for failing. Cause that's how you learn. And they've, they, you know, I, I think that's really important. Um, so I was a geriatric academic career award recipient uh, shortly after my um, fellowship. And, you know, that's a really large grant uh, to foster uh, junior faculty and build a career. And I centered it around wound healing. Um, and I built this uh, curriculum with interdisciplinary uh, method of wound healing. And I think, although it was a it was an okay curriculum. The biggest failure was the lack of sustainability. Like it was just me. And I was like, how I could not figure out a way to build in sustainability. And so that, that was definitely a really big failure. Um, because as soon as I left, it was gone. So one thing that I've now taken forward with that is I'm, um, currently a Tideswell scholar for the American Geriatric Society and also doing a, another wound curriculum, but I am not making the same mistake twice and already working with leadership, doing train the trainer and how to figure out the sustainability going forward. I, I know in the business world, that's like, a, they call it a key person problem where there's one person that if, if that person goes away, you know, no one can run the business. Uh, so you don't want that. You want to have multiple people that know how to do, yeah. do this thing. That's yeah. I feel like that must be a trait just inherent to physicians too, where it's, it's just so easy to do it. Not easy, but sometimes you feel like it's just best if I do it all myself because yeah, I know it'll get done I, that way. Exactly. And unfortunately, that doesn't lead to a sustainable model a lot of the time. Well, and I think that's part of the learning process is it's not exactly, I mean, I don't want to say it's like it's good enough, but you can develop something where you're happy with it. And, and I have, I really have grown as a person where I'm okay if someone makes some modifications, as long as you don't go totally off the rails. So <laughs> yeah. as long as you can do that, it's fine. Another question we always like to ask is what is, what's some of the best advice you've gotten in your career? Um, and you could, if it helps, you could think, yeah. you know, maybe as when you were a student, when you were a resident, when you were a, as an attending, which any, at any level, it doesn't matter. So, you know, I think that uh, I was thinking about this. This was actually, I think, the most challenging question I had because I've had a lot of, I've had a lot of, I've been fortunate to have a lot of support 
um, throughout my career. Uh, I think as a trainee, um, I know this sounds, especially in the day in the electronic medical record, don't put all this information in the medical record. Like you're, you're bogging yourself down, becoming highly inefficient with your notes. Um, that, I mean, I, that sounds really silly, but it, it, I mean, it's the constant advice I'm telling them. I'm like, you know, whenever I have a residence in clinic, I'm like, please do not regurgitate all the data. It's not helpful to you. It's not helpful to me. It's not helpful to our colleagues. Um, in my career, I think what's been like best advice, you know, there have been some people I think who've tried to give advice with regards to, you know, the political nature of certain organizations and who you become friends with or whatever. But I think the the best advice have been those people who have, or I don't know if advice is the right word, but um, best interactions have been people who really try to mo- role model and I seek people who it's clear that they don't have a political agenda and that really that the point of what they are uh, looking for is how, what, how can we continue to forward evidence-based medicine, whether it's in wound healing or geriatrics or internal medicine or what have you, and forward it for the patient and forward it for the healthcare system. When I start to get a, a sense of people being, you know, have ownership over educational information and not sharing and stuff, I've learned to just steer away from those people. And I, I think, I think that's something that we really need to be working on is really this, uh, much more collaboration. We're going to move on and give some picks of the week before we get into the topic. I want to make sure we have plenty of time to talk about wound healing. Paul, I'm going to let you as usual, kick it off. Yeah. Well, that now I feel silly for leading this one, but I, I actually, I just made a point of watching uh, Spider-Man into the spider verse. Um, and for a shame, I can actually recommend that even for your kids <laughs> this time around. It is for if, if you're not familiar with it, it's a movie that came out um, just last year. It's an animated feature. And uh, there's no point in going down the rabbit hole of the plot. But I will say it is the most visually interesting movie I think I've seen in the past five years. Like it is one of the most objectively beautiful things to look at. Um, the last 20 minutes are just sort of the psychedelic 2001 head trip on top of things where it actually hits emotional beats and actually makes you tear up and it's also the superhero trope. So it is, it's great. Kids will like it because it's easy to follow and has Spider-Man and that's fun. But I think there's enough for adults to watch and it's just good looking enough so that anyone could enjoy it. So I, I can't recommend it highly enough. I think it's up for an Academy Award for Best Animated and it's almost mm. kind of a crime because I think just Best Movie, I think it would belong just even in that category yeah. too because I, I really enjoyed it. Our family went to it at Christmas and um, yeah, it was amazing. Like we, as soon as we saw the uh, previews were like we got to go see that it felt like you were falling into a comic book it was amazing it's and incredible. kids nowadays that's how they're getting into reading is with graphic novels so they really loved it yeah yeah i thought that spider spider john mulaney as spider pig was just killing me it was, it was so <laughs> funny <laughs> there's actually a spider pig in that you just gotta watch the movie to find out the deal there now this movie wasn't even really on my radar so now i feel like this is my weekend priority is to like go check it out Carolyn, did you have a pick of the week? I I just finished a really great book actually called Educated by Tara Westover. So it's actually the memoir of like uh, this girl who grew up with Mormon survivalist parents, and she didn't have an opportunity to like receive really any education kind of growing up. So she received the majority of her education as an adult. So it's just sort of this fascinating read in terms of how one learns to become educated and sort of hold different beliefs and, and different sort of world views as you, as you go along your training and education. So great read. I'm going to give a, I'm going to give her a recommendation for it's a, it's a new podcast that I've listened to a couple episodes and this was recommended to me by a friend. It's called the knowledge project. And I believe they have a, it's based the, the, the guy who does it, his name is last name is Parrish. And uh, I, th- I want to say his first name is Shane. I should have probably had that prepared. But uh, he he has some he has a blog that he writes, but he also has the podcast, and he has some great interviews. And the one there's Naval Ravikant, and I'll, I'll of course link it in the show notes. He talked to him, and Naval was talking about his philosophy of reading books, and he's a he's he's an angel investor, but he just he just like reads like hundreds and hundreds of books, and he has them on his Kindle, and he'll read like you know, 50, 100 pages. If it's boring, he'll skip ahead. Uh, If he doesn't like the book, he won't finish it. And I think it's just an interesting philosophy about how to read because like I used to read like every single word in the entire book 
And then now I'm sort of starting to question if that's always the best thing to do, especially if I am like, you know, a third of the way through it. I'm like, I don't really like this book. So I thought it was a very interesting, that guy has a lot of like systems and uh, mental models that are really useful. So I'd recommend that, that episode specifically. Paul, I know that's way against, uh, I'm sure you're, I'm sure you don't like that. Well, I don't think reading should be an act of self-flagellation, but I, I don't know. Just, just going around to chapter to chapter, I feel like uh, yeah, we can talk well, about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, I, in nonfiction, and particularly, depending on the nonfiction, it's like, I, I think his point was, a lot of things probably could have just been a long blog post, not a whole book. So if you read it, sure. if you read it and you feel like you've gotten the point, it's it's different. It's I, I don't think he's necessarily doing that with like Cormac McCarthy. Uh, what's, your, what's that one? <laughs> Uh, blood meridian blood meridian yeah yeah Yeah, you probably shouldn't skip around in blood meridian (laughs) even actually probably doesn't matter that much to be honest (laughs) i couldn't even understand it reading it straight through paul all right before we get to the rest of the show tonight paul and Stuart, uh i believe we have a sponsor paul did you want to tell us a little bit about that i would love to we are lucky enough to be sponsored by mksap 18 uh which is brought to you by acp it is a great tool for a variety of learning needs i Personally, would not have passed the boards without it. And then it is also uh, great if you just want to pursue lifelong learning or use it as a reference um, or for helping other learners that you supervise. And then as an added bonus, it's great for nice chunks of both CME and MOC credits. I was like shocked by how many CME credits I got when I finished. (laughs) It's pretty great. Yeah. You can get it in either print or digital formats, but we highly recommend the MixUp 18 Complete because it's got the best value. It has everything you could possibly think of, the digital flashcards, board basics, virtual diagnosis, and the print. Frankly, it's all-inclusive. Yes, it is, Stuart. To echo what Paul was saying, MixApp, uh, I went through it a couple years ago when I was taking boards. I think I did MixApp 15 and MixApp 16. And I'm actually the kind of nerd that enjoyed going through all the questions and like seeing what I did and didn't know. I found it tremendously helpful. It's definitely a good way to like consolidate all the learning that you've done uh, and make sure you actually know what you're talking about because just passively reading is not as effective as doing the questions to actually test your self-knowledge. That's right. And Matt, did you know that there's also a money-back guarantee if you, for some reason, happen to not pass the ABIM exam? (laughs) Uh, I did not know that, Stuart, but that is actually good to know because there is a decent chance that I will not pass on the next try. (laughs) Lemire syndrome. (laughs) (laughs) So whether you want to be prepared for your exams or just enjoy lifelong learning like our own Dr. Watto, MKSAP 18 is the way to go. We recommend you check it out. Just visit acponline.org forward slash MKSAP to get started. Let's let's go on to the case, Carolyn. All right. So we have a great case for you guys to get today from Cashlock Memorial. So we have a 70-year-old male with a history of diabetes and high blood pressure. He's presenting to our outpatient clinic today with an ulcer on his left lateral malleolus that he's had for the past three months. He tells you that it just doesn't seem to heal no matter what he tries. And he's coming to you today because he describes a new fall smelling odor from the wound that started about a week ago. He also tells you that he's been covering the wound with honey to help it heal, which he states is just a home remedy home remedy that his family's used for years. He wants to know what else he can do to help his wound heal. So, Foy, I guess my first question is to you is, um, how do you approach uh, describing a wound in general? So, oh, so just the wound itself? Yes. Yeah. No, I have a pretty. I like to do a lot of bullet points. Um, so my, uh, first location is extremely important and I get onto the, uh, residents about, di- you know, if it's a pressure ulcer, differentiating the coccyx from the ischium from the sacrum, because they all have different etiologies. So it's, it's same with this is exactly, you know, where is the exact location? So that's the first part. Then describing the peri wound and that's not the edge. And that's really, and I'm feeling that area as well. I'm looking, for if there's any pain with palpation, um, I'm looking to see how dry or wet the skin is, how irritated, if that wound drainage is causing any kind of stasis dermatitis. And then the ed- then I so it's almost going from the outside in. Then I go to the edge, and I'm describing whether there's erythema coming out from the edge. If so, how significant and how far? I'm describing if there's maceration. That's that white bathtub appearance. Is the edge really well demarcated or does it have more of a moth-eaten appearance? And then also, is it clift? Meaning if you were a little person standing on the edge of that wound, would you just 
jump off the cliff or would you roll down the hill? Because it does matter. Um, and and then I then I get to the wound bed. So then talking it, and I try to keep that super simple. You know, there's all these fancy words, sloth and escar and fibrin. No, 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 no. You just want to know if it's viable or non-viable. So I kind of describe the percentage of viable tissue, which viable should be that pink granulation, you know, that granular apparent tissue or non-viable. And that can come in so many different facets. It can be dry, yellow, brown, gray, green. Um, and then the drainage, uh, when the wound clinic, the nurses know when they remove the dressings, they leave it on a separate, you know, dirty table so that uh, I know that how, you know, I asked the patient when was that last changed. So I get a sense as to how much drainage there was, you know, it's, is it small, medium, large, you know, something where they'd have to have it changed every day if they had to keep up with it. And then I also say the color of the drainage. So again, Going from the outside, coming in, location, peri wound, edge, wound bed, drainage. So this patient has a wound on their lateral malleolus. So I guess I wonder if you could help us differentiate and let us know if it's even worth doing so, sort of the difference between, say, a pressure ulcer versus a venous ulcer versus an arterial ulcer. Like as part of your assessment, um, how important it is to, to differentiate between those and then how do they kind of differ when you're, when you're making your initial assessment? Really, I mean, when the patient first comes to me and they you know, they present with this wound and they want to, they immediately want to know what what's on it. I was like, well, let's just back up a little bit. Do you remember how it started? You know, was it the car door or dishwasher injury, or was it uh, I was in the hospital after getting a hip replacement and I had some problems, my leg kept flopping out and it was a pressure. You know, did it start as a pressure? So really, you have to put your detective hat back on and try. And sometimes you can't figure it out because maybe the patient doesn't remember, but how it might have started. Um, you know, lateral malleoli actually are pretty tricky because they definitely could be a, their pressure area. So trying to figure out why it's important to figure out if it was pressure to begin with, you want to make sure that whatever pressure caused it, that that's been corrected, right? But I also am going to ask this guy, tell me about your day. What do you do on any basic day? Is there something that this wound is preventing you from doing that you want to get back to doing again? Um, and then I'm also asking about, especially something like this on the leg and on the outside part of the leg, what side do you tend to sleep on? Do you always sleep on your left side? Well, it, even if it's a venous leg ulcer, it doesn't matter. You're still going to be getting pressure on that area, and we got to figure out a way to get the pressure off when you're sleeping. So really, I, like I said, I think find, trying to do your best to find out what caused it if you can, but then still addressing the offloading principle, even if pressure might not have been the original issue. Are there any other questions that are important to ask? You mentioned asking, like, what side do you sleep on? How did it start? Any other things that we should have? Just sort of, it helps It helps us to have, like, a sort of, like, a, a script to go through with the, with the yeah. patients. Yeah. I mean, other than your basic, you know, what we all learned in our internal medicine training of how did it start? What makes it better? What makes it worse? How long has it been going on? Um, the... Part of the review assist, so there's some key review systems in social history that I always ask. Review of systems, I'm always asking about systemic signs and symptoms of uh, infection, you know, fevers, chills, increasing pain in the wound. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute in terms of why that's really important with infection. Um, and also asking about uh, nutrition issues. So are you having problems with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea? Have you lost weight that you didn't mean to lose or if you had a poor appetite. And there's actually been some recent data with regards to pressure ulcer specifically that if a patient answers yes to either one of those questions, the weight loss, unintentional weight loss or loss of appetite, they really should see a dietitian. It's a much more uh, sensitive marker of protein malnutrition where the lab markers any dietitian could tell you are useless. So really just screening those, those questions a lot easier and less poking. Um, so that's, that's my social history I like to hit on. I do screen often for obstructive sleep apnea uh, because patients with significant lower extremity swelling and maybe it's not completely understood, um, you kind of have to wonder if there's a sleep apnea component. And I really want someone to do that study to look at sleep apnea and wound healing because I've seen it myself that once we get that corrected, their, you know, their volume status gets under better control and they tend to heal faster. Mm. Um, 
And then uh, also just asking about sleep in general. A, a lot of our patients have difficulty with sleep. They have difficulty with depression, anxiety because of their wounds. And they suffer in silence. So definitely screening for those issues and getting social work involved if you have that as a resource. The social history component, and these some of these are kind of funny, and my residents look at me like I'm crazy. I do the usual, you know, smoking, um, where do you live? Do you have, you know, I'm, I'm a geriatrician, so I ask about function, you know, are there stairs you need to get through? Uh, I don't want to put you in a wheelchair for your diabetic foot ulcer, but if there's absolutely no safe way to offload it temporarily, can you get the wheelchair through your narrow 1920, you know, house? <laughs> um, you might not be able to. Uh, and then also... Uh, um, I ask about pets. And the reason I ask about pets is because they some animals like to lick wounds. Oh, no. oh God. Yeah. So what? gross. I <laughs> know. So I, I, it always like flabbergasts me. I've even had patients who swear by the fact that they've had some sinus tract in their tibia for years. And the thing that helps the, sw- the drainage go away is their dog licks it. And then it gets, I'm just like, okay. Oh. Um, but it, it's helpful uh, especially if I'm worried about some odd organisms that might be growing. And, um, and then also really hygiene and cleanliness. Um, I have plenty of patients that are suffering on, um, or struggling, excuse me, with housing issues and might be borderline homeless or frankly homeless and trying to work with hygiene and, um, that so, and you can get dog hair and wounds, et cetera. So it's definitely, those are my main screening questions. I wanted to swing back to what Paul was asking a little bit. I don't know that we directly addressed it. The venous versus arterial versus right. like pressure, neuropathic ulcer. Do you find it, is it important to differentiate between those types uh, when we're kind of considering treatment or, or mechanism? Um, <laughs> it, I'm laughing because sometimes this people get into real arguments at, at this during National Wound Society meetings. Um, so... Really, especially with the pressure ulcers on the foot, people argue, well, is it a pressure ulcer or a neuropathic foot ulcer? The mechanism, you're right, would be different, but the treatment's not going to be different. You still need to get the pressure off. Mm-hmm. Um, but you might, a, a, a neuropathic, a patient with a neuropathic foot ulcer, you might approach differently in terms of like, I mean, if there might be glycemic control issues, higher risk of maybe arterial insufficiency, ischemia issues. Um, and, but the pressure ulcer, I feel has really, unfortunately come this part of like, well, where did it start? Who owns it? Who's going to take the hit financially for it? And, um, I think that's been a challenge, uh, in terms of just saying, wait, can we just all back up and treat what's causing the wound? Um, and so, uh, but in terms of differentiating the four, the way I approach I do make a firm diagnosis. I do. I mean, you still need to make a diagnosis, but in terms of my approach, I also have uh, my bullet points that I like to do to make sure I'm not missing anything. So with every single patient, first I comment on whether the wound has a potential to heal. That's a whole nother subject we'll cover later. But then after that, I discuss offloading, edema management, nutrition slash diabetes. I kind of put those in the same arterial flow, infection, and then the local wound care. So the last thing I think about is what I'm going to put on this wound. I try to address all those reversible conditions first um, and then tackle what we're going to actually put on the wound. We know that with neuropathic foot ulcers, common, I mean, most common cause of neuropathic foot ulcers is diabetes neuropathy, that having edema greatly increases their amputation risk. So just as we would be doing compression wrapping for a venous leg ulcer, when someone comes in with a diabetic foot ulcer and has swelling, I know I need to get the swelling out of that foot just as important as I would for a venous leg ulcer. And so I'm curious, how do you get the swelling out? I mean, I feel like in clinic all the time, you'll see people who will come in with Lasix, you know, like I take Lasix for my leg swelling. What, what are your tools to try and help with some of the swelling in the legs? Well, I, you know, I only do a diuretic if someone has heart failure and a clinical indication, you know, if they don't have a real reason to be on a diuretic you actually could be worsening it and to where, because what you're doing is you're taking away the water, leaving the highly proteinaceous fluid behind and could be contributing to the eventual phlebolymphedema that might occur down the road. So uh, there's not 
a lot of, well, although I, let me, I stand corrected. There's increasing evidence in wound care. And I'm actually really happy to see some of the studies that are coming out and we're doing a much better job as a society, as a, you know, a, a, these national societies and do in fostering quality research. Um, the first strongest research was came uh, with treatment was of two issues, venous leg ulcers and diabetic foot ulcers. Venous leg ulcers, tons of Cochrane, randomized control trial labor level data, that compression wrapping is what is needed uh, to heal these wounds. And that's, you know, that's how you get the swelling out. But it doesn't stop there. You know, you don't just throw some wraps on someone. You're like, okay, you're fine. No, I have a <laughs> trifecta. I have my trifecta that I like to talk about. So there's compression wrapping. There's a walking program. And then there's leg elevation. So I think we do our patients a disservice because we say you need to have your legs up. Well, then they don't walk. And then they, you know, they eat because they're bored. And then they start to gain weight and everything else starts, you know, starts to spiral. They get deconditioned, et cetera. So that goes back to where I went at the beginning. And I said, well, tell me about yourself. Tell me what you do on any given day. And if you have a patient that happens to live on some property where it's an eighth of a mile to the mailbox, well, do you go and get the mail every day? Yeah. Okay. Well, could you go and get the mail three times a day? You know, what can you do that can extend your walking? And if some people are having trouble with walking because of neuropathy and they walk kind of in that Frankenstein kind of walk, not with that really good heel strike, then get physical therapy involved. Our th physical therapy team members are essential to this. So getting them on a really strong walking program and then elevating their legs. I don't know many people who can really elevate their legs above their heart, though. Um, you start to run into back and hip problems. So, so with every treatment, there's a side effect. But uh, definitely, I don't leave it alone with just the compression wrapping. And that's how I get the swelling out. There's also data that has shown that simple uh, heel pumps. So not, not it's not a machine. It's like the patient sitting in their recliner or whatever and just pumping their feet, dorsiflexing, dorsiflexing and plantar flexing their feet, that that has been associated with improved wound healing as well. So the point is, is you want that calf pump muscle function to improve. I, I liked how in your paper, you, you referred to the calf muscle as the heart, wait, was it the, um, the heart of the leg or something like that? Now I'm messing it up. I had it. Uh... I, ha I have it here. The calf muscle pump has been referred to as the peripheral heart because of its role in promoting venous return from the lower extremities. There yes. you go. And they, I mean, in the studies talk, they measure ejection fraction in these veins. Oh my it's gosh. amazing. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So. Are we going to talk specifics about, can, can you tell us specifics? So we, we're talking venous leg ulcers. We want the uh, peripheral heart to be pumping. So get the mail three times a day. And you mentioned wrapping. What are yeah. they wrapping their legs with? Yeah. So... You know, whenever, like I said, every treatment has a side effect. So before you prescribe the wrapping, you got to do a little bit of due diligence. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I always tell people is feel for pulses. Um, too many times I've had um, colleagues call me and curbside me about a patient. I was like, well, did they have pulses? And there's this pregnant pause on the other line. I was like, oh, you didn't feel. Because if, there, if you can't feel a pulse, then I'm going to get really nervous starting compression wrapping because a lot of people have mixed disease. They have mixed arterial and venous disease. Um, the, the guidelines and the data will tell you that before you prescribe compression wrapping, you need to do an ankle brachial index. I will tell you that I don't do that in my practice because I, I think I feel comfortable enough with the treatment. I start low, go slow, but go, another geriatric medicine principle. And so if I can feel a pulse, then I'll usually start people out with just, depending on their pain issues and um, how eager they are to do this treatment, I might just start them out with a simple two-layer wrap, and that might just be a rolled gauze and then a self-adhesive bandage over that. But the goal is to move them up eventually to a four-layer multi-component wrap, which is where the Cochrane data most supports has the best wound healing. There is, um, there's no other name for this other than a trade name, which is the Unaboot. There's the Duke's modified Unaboot, which the Unaboot is a zinc impregnated uh, bandage that you use for compression wrapping. And then the Duke's modified Unaboot is when you then put the self-adhesive bandage over that. And most people do the Duke's modified. Um, 
that used to be the standard of care. And I still sometimes use it. If I have a patient who comes in and they said, you know what, I had these wounds five years ago, nothing healed them except the Unaboot. I'm like, oh, I'm putting you right into Unaboots because that's what <laughs> hel- helped you before. I'm not going to put you through all this other stuff. Um, but it's not the first thing that I grab off the shelf anymore. And the reason that is, is because it's, um, it's an inelastic system. So when the patient's not walking, it doesn't do a really great job with the swelling. And when they walk, the pressure goes way high. It's a very stiff system. And that can be problematic if they have any kind of microvascular or ischemic disease. It also can be kind of painful. Um, it's easier to use in people who maybe are getting leg wounds and are not very ambulatory, like maybe in a nursing home kind of situation, and they're easy. Um, so, you know, that's where the nuances come in in style and you find out what works for you. But the take home on that is feel for pulses. The guidelines say to get an ankle brachial index and that it should be 0.8 or higher before starting any compression wrapping. And then I, if I see them in clinic, if I can feel a pulse, I'll start them on a two layer, maybe a three layer wrap and try to get them to a four layer if I can. And over, I have so many of my patients complain, you know, that it hurts and that it's painful. So in what time period are you sort of like escalating those layers of wraps? Yeah. So when I start on the first layer, on just a two layer wrap, I might do that again with the walking program and the leg elevation. And if they have heart failure, that's not under control. If they have heart failure, it's not under control. They shouldn't be wrapped. They need to get that under control before they're wrapped. Um, But, you know, making sure that they're euvolemic. Then um, probably about a week or two. Sometimes what I'll even do is I'll, um, our office will call the patient or if they're receiving this most often from home health, they'll call in a day, the home health nurse is there and saying, how are they tolerating? How are they doing it? Do you think we can move them up to a third layer? So again, this is a team sport trying to figure out, you know, what's working for the patient in their home. And at that time and getting information from other team members is really important. You mentioned that there's more modern therapies now, or maybe something something newer. What is there? What's better for wrapping than the Duke's Unaboot? Right. So the multi component wrap, which is where the latest Cochrane data goes to, is it's both. They used to call it um, multi layer, but multi component's a more accurate description, and it has a it has four layers. The first layer is just a cotton batting kind of comfort layer. The second layer is a crepe uh, long elastic. The third layer is almost like an ACE bandage. So still elastic, but not as, it's a shorter stretch. And then the last layer is a a more stiff, shorter stretch, self-adhesive bandage. So you're getting multiple components from long stretch to short stretch. And all that, when I mean by long stretch, it means if you were to take the bandage and, uh, you know, stretch it out, you know, as hard as you could, how easily would it stretch from one end to the other? So, um, it, but it's a mul- it has multi components, and the benefit of the multi component wrap is it does more compression at rest than a Duke's modified Unaboot would do, and then it increases, but not really high when they walk. So it's, it kind of gives them a little bit more of a still increases when they walk, but it's a little bit more level and not such a change from rest to walking. Can I hear what it would sound like when you you counsel a patient? Let's say someone comes in with a well, well this this patient here. Let's say we think this lateral malleolar lesion is is a venous ulcer. How might you tell them? How long is this going to take to heal? Uh, let's say we're putting them in a multi component wrap. And what can you Ooh. like? What sort of how high do you tell them to elevate their legs? Even that would be helpful. You, you mentioned most people can't elevate above the heart. Which is what they're, that's what they're supposed to do. Okay. Um, and I tell them to just get them up as high as they can, whatever they find comfortable, but keeping in mind, I don't want to cause back spasm and hip problems. And you don't want anybody getting some kind of hip contracture if they do it too much. Um, you asked a different question though, at the beginning where you were saying how long it would take to heal. Mm -hmm. And I'm often having a realistic expectation talk. So remember how I told you, that I walk through kind of my bullet points to make sure I'm covering all my bases with the wound healing. The first thing I talk about um, with patients also is healability. Mm-hmm. So how easy, you know, is, and I kind of put it in good, fair, guarded, or poor <laughs> to no potential to heal. Um, so, you know, if this gentleman comes in, he 
let's say he he maybe got a, a car door injury or something, um, and it just hasn't healed. He comes in and I see on exam, he's got spider veins, he's got varicose veins, he's tried doing this stuff for three months. Um, I'll t- I say, I tell you what, let's just try it my way for two weeks. I'll have you um, come back to the clinic and we'll see how much improvement you get in two weeks. Because you really do want to see about a four it, with venous leg ulcers and the same with neuropathic foot ulcers. Well, a little bit different, but with venous leg ulcers, you want to see about 40% healing um, within four weeks. So I want to see it going in that direction. And the same with neuropathic foot ulcers, about 40% healing, 50% healing in four weeks. And if you're not seeing that, you need to be changing what you're doing. There have been some nice randomized control trials that have come out lately that have looked at venous ablation therapy. So the vascular surgery guidelines will tell you that everyone who comes in with a venous leg ulcer absolutely needs to have a uh, venous incompetency study. I do not do that because I'm a big believer in stewardship of resources. So if someone comes in and it's like, well, I don't know if, you know, and it's not a recurrence, it's a new thing. Let's just try and heal you with the compression wrapping and then I have to talk about them, what they have to have after the compression wrapping enclosure. Um, but if someone tells me it's just not healing or, or I'm finding it's not just healing or it's recurring, then I will get a venous incompetency evaluation where they look at the superficial perforator and deep vein system, looking at how those valves act and see if they're a candidate for an outpatient procedure that's a simple ablation. Um, you know, back in the, you know, originally that was devised for cosmetic reasons and uh, to, you know, help those swollen legs feel better. But now nice randomized control trials will show that it does help with healing. Uh, so it's, it's definitely something that I've gone to be much more assertive about when my patients uh, come in with these recurrent or recalcitrant wounds. I think that what you said was really interesting about cost, uh, kind of like what do you think are the best interventions in terms of high value care for patients with complex wounds? Let me break that down by wound type. Um, so the venous leg ulcer, if there's recurrence or recalcitrance, I definitely think having them evaluated for uh, a venous ablation. Arterial wounds, I mean, it, definitely they, they need to see the vascular surgeon and have an opinion with regards to whether they're a bypass or um, uh, a angiogram uh, you know, candidate. There have been some studies that are, I think, are currently being done right now that are looking to see which is a better outcome or non-inferior studies. Um, neuropathic wounds, the best cost effective treatment, diabetic foot ulcers is a total contact cast. The problem with, and that, uh, that's the other Cochrane data. So by far, um, you know, you 85% of the, if you have a diabetic foot ulcer, 85% of those ulcers can be healed in four to six weeks with a total contact cast. The reason why it's not done on a standard basis is the time and skill level needed to do it. You know, you put it on a patient, they need to come back in a few days because they all their edema has gone down in the cast and they start pistoning in the cast. So you have to replace it. And then they have to come back every week uh, to have a new one replaced. So that's a, a challenge with that. But it's definitely something that we've been pushing in our um, clinic to move uh, towards. Um, those, and are, then with- those are kind of like a plaster cast that an orthopedist would fit. Uh, typically a podiatrist, actually, okay. we have a, um, so podiatrists have been trained in that or physical therapists. Um, also I've seen that in, in wound healing clinics. I've seen physical therapists be the ones to put them on. You just have to have someone who's been taught and there's a lot of different total contact casts out there on the market. Some that take longer than others and some that have argued that are more effective than others. Um, there've not been any head to head official trials though. So what I do is I pick the one that has been easiest for our team to learn to put on so in the shortest amount of time so that we will use them. And then pressure ulcers, who the most cost effective thing for them is prevention. <laughs> just yeah. don't get them. I mean once you get them it, it's just it's it's not the cows out of the barn, but it's pretty darn close. I mean it, it's really hard. Um, and also people Healthy people don't get pressure ulcers, right? So it's frail older adults. It's people with spinal cord injury that maybe had had some illness that laid them up or they had a defective equipment that they didn't realize was defective. Those are your two largest populations that tend to get them. And if you have a frail older adult with dementia, 
who's getting a pressure ulcer um, and, you know, that possibly could have been prevented, then it's time to have a different discussion as to what's important to that patient and that family member. You're, you're bringing up pressure ulcers and there was, there was some stuff that as I was kind of preparing for this, they were talking about getting, minimizing dead space. I had never really heard that Mm. used outside the lungs before. (laughs) They were talking about sort of like, you know, the, acute drainage from a wound can be like nutritious and chronic drainage can be inflammatory. It was just like fascinating stuff. It sounds like there's a lot of, and I know that with, with those type of wounds, there's a lot of like honey and silver and all this stuff. Can you kind of demystify that sort of thing a little bit for us? I I like that you were use the word demystify. I had a colleague describe it as hand waving, (laughs) um, (laughs) which kind of hurt my feelings, frankly. Uh, um, well, but to be fair to everybody, there's never there's never one product that's shown it's the best and is the most effective for wound healing. And the reason that is, is because you have to address the underlying conditions. So it, you know, I had a, I, there's this one nurse that I worked with who loved to say, you can put peanut butter on that wound, but if we don't get the swelling out of your leg, it's not going to heal. You know, <laughs> and she was right. Um so there is a there are really great articles out there on what's called wound bed preparation. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my particular favorites is from Schultz, Gregory Schultz, in 2003, and that is from oh from wound repair regeneration. Uh, and Dr. Schultz is uh, he, he he has a PhD in uh, in you know uh, bioscience and he does a lot of work with now with biofilm and uh, with wound healing and he's a really great writer and it's it's an excellent article that really starts to talk about the pathogenesis of uh, chronic wounds and and wound bed preparation. So wound bed preparation, this is all it is. It's moisture balance, bacterial balance, and debridement. And remember how I told you I'm an amateur gardener. So here it comes. <laughs> so, and I tell this to my patients, especially living in the Pacific Northwest where everyone has a garden, this is very easy. So I say, okay, your wound is like a garden. Um, if I pull out all the weeds, which is all of the bacteria, I'm going to be pulling up the good soil with it. So I don't want to, I don't want to kill and throw a bunch of weed killer on the garden. Okay. So that's why we have, tend to avoid the antiseptics. Um, but we do need to take out some of those weeds. So whenever I'm seeing the patient, you know, I might be doing some sh- some conservative sharp debridement, or I might uh, choose if they can't tolerate that pain wise, I might be uh, doing a product that will foster autolytic debridement. Those tend to be your hydrogels and your hydrocolloids. There's enzymatic debrider. There's only one on the market called collagenase. The challenge with that though is it has to be applied every day, and it's incompatible with silver. So really, you want to get away from any kind of product that's applied every day. Frankly, a patient who's receiving home health care and they have no other way to change their wound, they're not going to be able to do it every day. And collagenase is very expensive. So if you're going to use it, use it right, um, even for maybe a short period of time. So that's my debridement component there. Moisture balance. You don't want your garden too wet and you don't want it too dry. If the, if the, if the wound garden is too wet, then you'll start to get uh, too much bacteria and it'll get infected. If it's too dry, then the, uh, the healthy cells can't come in and, and start to grow, frankly. Uh, so you're going to be choosing your products based on uh, how wet the, the wound is. And then the bacterial balance. So there's some evidence that suggests that having a little bit of bacteria in the wound uh, will foster, uh, you know, the they talk about, you know, you have the macrophages and the neutrophils come in and they're your cleanup crew. And then from that, um, your metalloproteinases, which are important, but sometimes the ratios, this, this is where the, the, the bench science gets really fascinating because they talk about how the ratios can change over time and they can change with aging. Um, and then even though we sometimes need them, too, they can be too much of a good thing. But if you have that a little bit of that bacteria present to foster just the natural progression of wound healing. Um, And of course, if you have too much bacteria, then you'll have an infection. So when you're choosing a product, you have to decide what's most important at that time. You know, if you see a patient where you're like this particular patient, so you were telling me about how the reason he's coming in now is 
it's not just not seem to heal. He probably would have come in another month. But the thing that's really bothering him is it's smelling bad, right? Yep. And um, so then you're wondering, well, is it smelling bad because of what he's putting on it? Or is it starting to get infected? Um, I'd be asking him about pain as well. And if the main issue is smell and drainage, I'm going to choose a product that is going to address both of those issues. Um, the smell could probably just be addressed in terms of proper cleansing technique or using a, an absorbent product that has an antimicrobial like silver or codexin or iodine. Um, and that can usually address the odor pretty easily because it tends to be anaerobes. Um, but if sometimes it happens to be what they're putting on it, which he mentioned the home remedy of the wound and I actually, of honey, I actually had a patient who went to the farmer's market and bought honey to put on their wound. And I was like, no, 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 no. Um, cause it's, it's not pasteurized. So yeah, again, the three main points to take away from that moisture balance, bacterial balance and debridement. And you are not going to find a product that does all three. You might have some claims that there are products that do all three. Uh, it, there, it does not exist. So do you just kind of pick the predominant issue at the time of the wound, or is it usually a combination of them? No, I do choose to pick the predominant issue. I do often do conservative sharp debridement with a curette, um, in you know, dermal curette in the clinic. And both, especially in the diabetic foot ulcer literature, but even there was a nice, um, it was a retrospective study about done a few years ago that looked at three patients with 300,000 wounds. I mean, it was a lot of wounds and they found that the more often they came into clinic for the conservative sharp debridement, everything else being equal, the underlying issues are being addressed. They had much faster healing. And the thought behind that is you're attacking the biofilm. Uh, there's been some products lately that claim that they address biofilm. Um, I, I think we'll start to see if that's really the case, but what we do know definitively is that conservative sharp debridement is our best weapon against biofilm. You mentioned silver and our, one of our co-hosts, Stuart, uh, had sent me a message. What about Silva Pour versus Silva Dean? And I don't know if either of those is brand names. It sounds like they're both silver products. No, Silva Dean is a brand name. Okay. Uh, silver Pour? See, yeah. I'm always learning. So there's more than a thousand products out there on the market. Okay. And I have patients coming and telling me what the, the silver from in wound products tends to break down into two groups, one that's nanocrystalline silver and others that isn't. Okay. So um, if I remember correctly, I don't use Silvadine a lot. Um, the reason being that you, the half-life only lasts 12 hours. And again, it's that, it, you know, you're, you're wanting a product that's going to have longer wear time so that the wound can do what it needs to do. You don't want to keep undressing that wound, exposing it to air, exposing it to microbes, changing the temperature potentially in the wound and defeating the purpose. You want to be able to have addressing. Some of these have seven day wear time. And if you don't have a ton of drainage, that's great. You know, letting your body do what it needs to do. Um, the nanocrystalline silver is really high potency silver. And sometimes I do need to go and use a product with nanocrystalline silver. Um, if it just seems like there's just so much bacterial burden, uh, that's causing a problem with the wound healing and the way that's a clinical judgment. That's, you know, a lot of pain, um, a lot of friability, bleeding, uh, they constantly are getting infections from the wound. So that might be something, again, it's temporary. And the guidelines really tell you with any of these antimicrobials that you shouldn't be using them more than two weeks. Uh, I will use them longer when it comes back to, so tell me about your day. And they have significant hygiene issues. Like I have patients who don't have running water. So I, if I really have to worry, you know, if, if infection is going to be a concern, that I might be someone who's using the antimicrobial for a longer period of time. All right. Well, let's let's circle back to the case. Um, I do want to address this. So the patient's coming in and things are starting to smell funny. So clearly, the underlying concern is for infection here. I'm just I'm wondering what factors or what what characteristics of the wound make you more nervous than others or make you concerned about infection. Right. So there was a real. There's a. This is another article that I like. Um, people with whom I work to read. It was a rational clinical examination in JAMA. It's an oldie, but a goodie back in 2003 um, that looked at, does this patient have an infection of a chronic wound? And so what they looked at, they looked at patients uh, from all types of wounds. 
Um, and you could argue in terms of the mechanism of infection being different from wound to wound, but they looked at all different types of wounds and they looked at all these different facets. They looked at uh, signs and symptoms, you know, odor, drainage, redness, fever, um, pain, uh, et cetera. And they found that the likelihood ratio, the positive likelihood ratio was 11 if someone reported they had increasing pain in the wound. Hmm. I mean, that that's pretty darn good, right? So I, I agree, you know, I'll have patients, they're like, well, what if they have neuropathy? I mean, sometimes I have patients are like, you know, dog, I don't feel anything. I was like, has your ankle felt weird at all? Um, are you getting increasing spasm for someone with a spinal cord injury? Because that's how they manifest pain. So I will have patients who's like, doc, every time you ask me about pain and I never have pain, but gosh, now I have pain. I was like, uh oh, because <laughs> now I'm worried <laughs> that yes. And I, uh, I have a very low threshold to, uh, I obtain a curetted specimen culture. So a deep tissue culture. And, um, and then I'm starting them on antibiotics and waiting for those culture results to come back. Um, it doesn't go the reverse, though, just because yeah. they don't have pain. It's not a strong negative likelihood ratio, unfortunately. Um, but it's a, it's, all, it's a really good screener question and a good routine thing to ask your patient. Mm -hmm. So if we are unable to get sort of a deep wound culture, uh, are there certain like superficial swab techniques that you think are better than others to get better culture? There pain? is one that has more data than others called the Levine technique. So you want to make sure... You know, whenever you assess a wound, you want to make sure it's cleansed really well. Wound products leave residues, um, you know, there's dog hair and other stuff. So you want to make sure that the wound is cleansed really well with normal saline. Um, you could even take a dry gauze and rough it up just a little bit and attempt to um, conservatively get that biofilm off. And that's even within the scope of practice of a home health nurse that they'd be able to do that. And then what you could then what you teach them to do is you just take a bacterial swab. You want to go to the cleanest, deepest part of the wound. So you don't want to be sticking it in a pus pocket or anything like that. You push it into that deepest, cleanest part of the wound. You press and turn it 360, and there you go. So you want to be able to express some fluid uh, from the wound when you're doing that. But we don't want to go for a pus. So we no don't want to go. Okay. We don't necessarily want to go for a pus. You're probably just going to get a ton of organisms. And you're not going to be sure. Um, there's an exception to every rule on that one. I mean, even today I was in clinic and the ID doc is like, Oh, there's pus. Let's get a culture. I was like, okay, you're the ID doc. <laughs> um, but he was specifically looking for something in particular. He was looking for pseudomonas or something like that because of the patient's history. So in these lines with pain, and this is going to lead into the next question about dressings. Do you, are you pre-medicating patients before you're doing this kind of Oh, yes. Sorry. Thank you. Um, and I'm really glad you addressed that because this is also a wonderful thing that we can prescribe for our patients that's really easy. So if patients have a, when people have pain, I'm very specific. When do you have pain? Is it pain all the time? Is it what kind of pain, the quality of it? Is it pain only with dressing changes? If it's pain only with dressing changes, then the first thing I'll go for is topical lidocaine. I, I like to use the 4% solution. Um, you you soak some gauze in it. Uh, you know, after you've cleaned on the off the wound, soak some gauze in it and put it on the wound and let it sit there for five to 10 minutes. And we'll do that. I'll talk to the patient, get the rest of their history, and then I'll do the conservative sharp debridement. You can also write your wound care orders to reflect that. Remove dressing, apply 4% soaked lidocaine, you know, lidocaine soaked gauze for five to 10 minutes, then apply new dressing so that if they, they can at least get some temporary pain relief right around that time uh, when they tend to have pain. Did you tell us specifically how you're cleaning the wound? Even that little thing is to me, I'm just like, do I put tap water on it or? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, the tap water I'm okay with. Well, if the well water gets a little dicey sometimes. So, um, I also remember I like to talk in bullets. So I have bullets for my local wound care. I don't sure. like to write paragraphs. So I write down, this is mostly my home health order is the way I do it. And I go location, cleanse with, apply, cover with, secure. So really basic. I might throw an edge in there too. So remember with, when we go back to what our assessment was, um, with cleansing, you know, you want, uh, in the assessment, I, I, I noted the color of the drainage. And the only time that's important is if you get that really bright green drainage that's conservative for a possible pseudomonas. Mm -hmm. Pseudomonas does not like 
acidic environments. So I'll use a dilute acetic acid vinegar that our pharmacy happens to mix up. You can teach someone how to, um, usually the way the hospice agencies tend to mix it up is they take those, um, the sterile water, the you know, the liter bottles, they pour out a hundred cc's and then they pour a hundred cc's of vinegar, shake it up. And there's a nice dilute solution. Um, so you cleanse with the acetic acid or, or you could do just normal saline, really inexpensive. Um, some home health agencies really love the wound cleansers. They have a surfactant in it that can theoretically remove some of the, uh, bacterial debris, but there's been no head to head studies that have shown that one is better than the other. And I'm always thinking about cost. So if normal saline is going to get it done, then I'm going to be happy with that. Um, we can talk about showering wounds in a minute. Uh, so, but, so there's cleanse, um, right. So you cleanse with the normal saline. Um, and then I might put an edge protect there. So if people have a really macerated white edge where there just seems to be so much drainage, then some kind of zinc, paste barrier right around the edge can be helpful, just building a wall around that and keeping all the drainage contained so that when you have the protectant dressing on top, it goes into the dressing and doesn't spill out onto the skin all around it. Um, right. So that's kind of, and then, then we get to the actual products. So I can go into the basics of the products there, unless there are other questions that you had about cleansing. Well, actually, let me let me step back. J just with cleansing, like how much do you put on? Do you put the whole liter on, or you just kind of oh, wet the wound? Oh, yeah, and... no, no. I mean, uh, you can you easily just just take a four by four gauze, wet the four by four gauze, and cleanse the wound, making sure that you've gotten all the whatever the old product was off, um, and maybe even a little bit just some of the bacterial debris. The wound cleansers are easy that way. You just spray it directly on the wound and then clean it with the four by four gauze. This is great. See, this is very simple stuff, yeah. but it's just like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like I've, I was never practically taught that. So I just don't, yeah. I was like, do I just so pour your it? wound care costs $30,000 per can. <laughs> <laughs> most, <laughs> most, most of the wound care I've seen it's, is like, it's so, expensive vinegar. Yeah. So I have someone, <laughs> I have someone bite on, uh, like something leather and, or take a swig of whiskey and then, you know, Did it's you mostly train during the civil war. <laughs> <laughs> they take a swig of whiskey and then I pour that on their wound. That's what I see in sure. movies. So that's all I Excellent. know. Excellent. A little okay. Philly tap water, which already has the antimicrobial and some SSRIs in it. So it's, it's, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Or my favorite, just call the wound care nurse. So, yeah. so we were, we were going to ask one of the questions you we were going to ask, it, you know, when I was learning steroid topical steroids, there's a million products and and I just learned like one low potency, medium and high potency. Do you have any such thing for the kind of wound care topical stuff? Like maybe just a couple agents or one or two from each, each type that you can, yeah, each category. So if I want to add moisture to a wound, I like to go with a hydro gel, a wound gel. Um, if, if it has any kind of depth to it, um, or if it has, um, uh, or if it's just a really dry appearing wound and I want to get that uh, aut autolyzed, you start to break down. Um, so I like the hydrogels. If they are a really superficial but dry wound, then I might look at more of the oil emulsion gauzes. So that's kind of my adding moisture. There's not Most wounds are wet, so there's very few products where you're having to add moisture. But those are probably my two main go-tos that I think, if you, if you think, you know, partial thickness oil emulsion gauze, uh, has a little bit of depth to it, um, or just seems like it's a thicker, drier wound than I would do, um, uh, some wound gel. Okay. Then comes the moisture, the, if it's real moisture wicking, uh, calcium alginate, there's a, is a really great product. Um, it, uh, really does a great job of absorbing excess moisture and it's relatively inexpensive, um, most products need to have a topper on top of that. So doing some kind of foam topper. And so then you get dual cushioning as well as more, uh, moisture wicking. And then the calcium alginate sometimes has silver in it. So you just have to look for the AG on the packaging. So if you need that combination, you know, multi-component dressing, so to speak of having both, uh, the moisture wicking and releasing of silver. And then by far, one of my favorites is the Cadexamer iodine. Uh, it seems a, it's a counterintuitive kind of dressing because what it is, it comes in a tube um, and it's a brown cream or paste. 
but it is what it has is these um, beaded technology that has cadexmer iodine in it that slowly releases the iodine. So theoretically, not a cytotoxic is straight beta iodine or iodine. Um, and it's extremely absorbent, like se- I believe it's seven times more absorbent than just regular gauze. It a little goes a long way. I've seen people make the mistake of slathering the stuff on, but you just need to go a little is a long way. And it goes on chocolate brown. As it absorbs the excess moisture, it turns an off white. So you have to prepare the patient saying it's not that you have a ton of dead tissue in your wound now. That's actual the, the product. Again, why it's important to cleanse the wound before you make an assessment. So those are probably my main go-tos that I really like that I think any kind of basic wound care you could go for. We probably do want to talk a little teeny bit about negative pressure wound therapy because I get that question a lot as well. Um, It was devised principally for post-operative wounds and has the best data for that. it, I, you know, I'll receive phone calls from home health nurses who are taking care of a bad pressure ulcer and go, well, can we put a negative pressure wound therapy on it? And um, most often, I mean, if, if drainage is a really, really big concern and it's causing torture to the patient uh, in terms of getting changed all the time, then I think it's worth it from a patient-centered modality, at least just for two weeks, if you can try and get some of the drainage under control. Of course, evaluating for osteomyelitis and other relative contraindications um, before starting it. So it has a place, um, it's most effective if someone's going to be going to the operating room, having a wound surgically debrided. So other than my conservative sharp debridement, but really surgically debrided, um, and then having a negative pressure wound therapy applied uh, shortly after that um, and doing really well. Most most wound dressings, um you said there's some that can be on for up to seven days. Mm-hmm. It, I guess it just depends. Like if, if the dressing is, is still dry, if it's not like soaked through, you can keep it on for more than one day. Is it, do you just kind of change them oh, as absolutely. often as you need to? I I've gotten good at just kind of gauging that, you know, if, if the patient tells me, well, this is how much drainage there is after three days. And I look at it and I was like, okay, it's striking through, then they're going to need to change it every three days. But if there's absolutely no drainage on it and they haven't changed it for several days, then I'll just say, let's just change it once a week. Um, The multi-component compression wraps don't tend to stay up for a week. So can't do that too often. Um, The the Duke's Modified Unaboot, though, does does tend to nicely stay up for a week. So I can get the multi-component wraps maybe changed twice a week. Um, if, because it, once they start to sag, you run into other complications. Um, but you're looking at a lot of these dressings, if they're not having a ton of drainage, when they come in to see you, first off, you will make sure you have the right product. Should I be adding moisture to the wound? Um, and then if it can go for a week, then that's great. You run into challenges where patients want to bathe more often than a week, right? So they can, you know, if, if it's a leg, they can bag up their leg. I worry about falls, uh, it goes back to my geriatrics training. Um, uh, but I will tell them, you know, when the home health nurse comes, take down the dressing. If you're able to hop in that shower, feel good, you know, get, get nice and clean, let the soapy water run over it. Um, and then you'll cleanse it when you get out and the home health nurse will dress it. Okay. That answered a lot yeah. of questions. I yeah. think we should start to wrap up here because we definitely have to let you go and get back get back to the family. Yeah. Carolyn, what other questions do you have or do you want to just jump to take home points or uh let's sh- where we're on it. let's just jump to take home points. So so what are your main take home points for our listeners? Always address the underlying conditions and it doesn't although it you want to know what the cause of the wound is and the, the etiology, the diagnosis Address the offloading, the pressure, address the swelling, address the nutrition and diabetes on a lower extremity wound, feel for pulses, ask about pain and be worried about infection if it's present, and then start your local wound care regimen. Great. And is there anything else you'd like us to plug? Oh, yes. It's one thing I'd like you to plug. Um, So I've talked a little, I've referred a little bit to the 
wound societies, uh, the national societies out there and some of the great work that they're all doing and debating and how it gets really interesting sometimes. Um, and I'm a member of a couple of them. The Wound Healing Society is known both nationally and internationally as the premier scientific uh, organization that's focused on wound healing, research and education. Um, and they provide evidence-based educational materials for researchers, clinicians, and our industrial partners who have helped forward uh, wound healing techniques. So the Wound Healing Society guidelines happen to be, um, they're the standard in the industry, and they're also a free on the Wound Healing Society website. And that is uh, woundhill, W-O-U-N-D-H-E-A-L dot org. So check it out. All right, we'll definitely link to that. This was so helpful. I can't thank you enough for all your time. This this oh, was sure. fantastic. This was fun. We've had some great guests from OHSU. This is uh, oh, it's, good. It's been it's been nice for us. So way to represent. Excellent. This has been another episode of the Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. There we go. Get show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. We're committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. A very special thanks to everyone on our social media team. Uh, Hannah Abrams on Twitter, Beth Garbs on Instagram, and Chris True, the man on Facebook. And until next time, I'm Dr. Carolyn Chan. And I'm Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. <laughs> and I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. And goodbye. Paul, I did it. I did. I, strong I, think, work. I think that was one take. <laughs> one <Paul>. take. <laughs> First time. Fantastic. Does anyone have an awful wound pun they like to throw in before we? Uh, I I have a, a wound care joke. Oh, boy. All right. <laughs> I'm really, <laughs> I'm very scared. Yeah. So, so here we are. We can always edit it out later if it's, if it's not, not good enough. But, uh, so a gauze decides to, to go to Cedar Point. Uh, for a day and he's like so excited because he's going to ride all all the roller coasters so the gauze goes up and he wants to get on you know the the thrill dragster of course when the classic 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 roller coasters and the attendant is like hey i'm sorry but you can't ride this ride and gauze is like hey that's not fair man i'm, I'm just trying to enjoy my day and he's like well i'm sorry i can't let you in because you know you aren't tall enough you're only a four by four <laughs> really oh. long walk <laughs> uh, I kind of enjoyed the story up until the punchline. I, I uh, thought you were heading towards an afraid not situation, but I four by four. <laughs> one day I'm going to hit one that's going to land really hard. Yeah, <laughs> but not this one. I'd I'd say there's got to be at least a handful of people that really really enjoyed that one.